Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop and Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. and the United States as we look around the globe in 143 different nations looking for the best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. And besides looking at the technologies, the products and services, we're looking at the infrastructure that is needed in order to feed, clothe, and house nine billion souls as we reach 2050. And so food is really a critical uh, issue as long with uh, water, sanitation, and other critical needs. And we have uh, a guest with us that is addressing this issue but actually looking at it in a different way of going back into urban areas and taking land that has been fallow for a long time, in some cases several hundred years, and bring it back into productivity for herbs, vegetables, and also even fruit. Uh, Pertula George Red is the executive director of uh, the Common Good City Farm. And Pertula, welcome to the Emerald Planet. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I tell you, Common Good City Farm, that is a fantastic name. Thank you. Tell us the origin of that. Um, so uh, we, when we moved from 7th Street Garden five years ago, um, it, we moved to a larger space. And so we sought the advice of many people in the neighborhood and um, did a poll, had people put in their um, suggestions for the name, Common mm -hmm. Good City Farm, is one of the names that oh, came Oh, so up. this actually was a group <clears throat> orientation and you had many people involved in selecting mm -hmm. the name as you were making your move. Right, so Common Good City Farm started as a grassroots movement at 7th Street Garden. Started from um, two young women who had, who saw a need in the neighborhood, saw that there was limited food access and that um, uh, that there were few opportunities for young people to engage in agriculture. And so they sought the help of volunteers. And from day one, this was a grassroots movement, um, volunteer run. And so, yes, they did engage everyone in coming up with the name and um, later moving to a uh, form a, a baseball, what was a baseball field and transforming that half acre farm into a vibrant, productive space. Oh, that is absolutely incredible. Tell us a little bit about the vision and mission of the uh, Common uh, City Farm and what you're doing as far as reaching that mission and those objectives that you have. Sure. So um, our, our mission really is to um, grow food in a sustainable way and educate people on how to become more self-sufficient, how to grow their own food, how to cook it, and why it's important. And we do this through lots of education on the farm for um, underserved community members, people who have limited access and also don't have the resources to afford healthy, fresh produce. And so we give them the skills, um, the resources to become more self-reliant and um, also to reach across generation, across barriers, um, to work together as a community and therefore becoming our vision, becoming a sustainable model, a replicable model of a community-based urban food system. Well, what you're doing is that you're really looking at your, your uh, name, the common good, as well as a city farm, right? Yes. And you're bringing that into reality and involving people. And it's just amazing looking at the photographs, the number of people you have involved, and also the ages. I know you're saying mm -hmm. this is multi-generational, and we're going to explore that topic mm -hmm. in, uh, in a little while. But it really is, you're almost growing from babies all the way to grandmas and grandpas and everybody in between. Yes, and we're really proud of the diversity on the farm. And yes, it is for the common good. That's why the name um, resonates so well with what we're doing. And um, we, we have little children. You can come to the farm on any day that we're open and you will see 
um, young children with their parents, um, with their older siblings. You'll see grandmothers. Um, sometimes you may see a school group because uh, we host school groups once a week. Mm -hmm. and, and diversity in background, socioeconomic background, um, ethnicity, um, gender, um, age. It's, it's just an amazing community to grow together. And that's one of the things that we're really proud of. It, it, pre, pre, it um, presents a very welcoming space for everyone to thrive and, and building strong communities is very important in, in the agriculture movement. Well, I think what you're, what you're really exhibiting uh, through the uh, Common Good City Farm is that everybody needs to be involved in coming up with their own food mm -hmm. and being sensitive to where their food is coming from and then to actually start producing because we're bringing in more and more food from you know thousands of miles away within you know North America or around the globe some of its 10 mm -hmm. 15,000 miles away mm -hmm. and so having people that can actually grow their own food and do it within their own community says a lot about the, the strength and the sustainability of the community itself mm -hmm. Absolutely. It builds resilience. It creates social change because people are working together. Um, and food is a critical need. It's a, um, a basic necessity. And um, when we're faced with crisis, we typically look for solutions. And you'll find now more and more people are looking for places to grow their own food, whether it's um, in the um, pot on their porch or in the window in a grow bag or rooftops um, because there's a need. Um, there are lots of food deserts in, in D.C., in our neighborhood even. And actually and, any urban area <laughs> has food deserts. There's no doubt about right. that. Right. And, and so it's very important um, to, to go back to the time, you know, when we were able to produce our own food. It's very um, good for the environment, it's good for our health, and um, with everything going on with our um, the health, um, obesity crisis, and um, nutrition, and preparing a generation for those challenges, um, you have to find the space and be creative and grow the food that we need. Um, to create a healthy society. Well, I think having the uh, diversity that you're talking about, all the ages and various races, uh, races and ethnicities and religions and all that, uh, the one thing that you are doing is that you're allowing people in a very non-threatening and quiet, contemplative environment mm -hmm. to really get to know each other as human beings and to share and learn about you know, uh, religious holidays from other faiths and, and also what people are facing within their own homes. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like what you're doing is not only just food and helping the environment, mm -hmm. but you're building a true sense of community. Yes, we are. And we do this not just on our urban, half acre urban farm, but in our um, community garden that we built. Uh, we, we installed 57 raised beds and have 57 gardeners that um, work side by side. And we have a waiting list of over 100 people. Oh my goodness, yes. you have 100 people trying to get yes. into the program. Yes, and this is typical for community gardens, but mm -hmm. overall um, we engage over 100 people at any one time. If you look at the community garden and the farm and the different groups of people that we bring to the farm. So yes, it, it definitely, you have lots of great conversation um, and and you you find that People, you know, like I said earlier, break down stereotypes about each other because you, you're on a you know, level playing field, which is the farm, and you talk about the vegetables and you talk about your life, so you're sharing stories. And everybody's and, out there, it's raining on you, yes. or it's the sun's beating down, it's very the, hot, and yes. uh, so uh, everybody is uh, dealing with the flies mm -hmm. and the mosquitoes and, the mosquitoes and everything terrible. else that you have. So <laughs> yeah. it really does uh, bring a level, level playing field and brings commonality to yes. uh, the experience and it really goes without saying is that this is truly growing uh, locally and nationally mm -hmm. if you have you know you're 57 you have a hundred on the, the list and this seems to be nationwide correct yes yeah, so in DC um, the 2010 um, community garden census showed that we had about 36 community gardens mm -hmm. um, in DC that's about 27 acres under production and since then we've you know, installed 57 raised beds. We also installed six raised beds across the street at a, um, 
a housing complex next to the farm for low income residents. And we have seen other gardens pop up in DC, like Wangari Gardens and um, Walker Jones Farm. And people come to us all the time and tell us, can you help us start a garden? We saw a vacant spot. So we just, we want to do some gorilla gardening or, um, you know, we hear about it from people outside DC mm -hmm. uh, calling us whether they want to write about the work that we're doing or they want to learn best practices from us. So the interest is there and um, definitely urban gardening is growing. Uh, looking at what you're doing as far as the common uh, good uh, city farm, what kind of services do you provide and, you know, like uh, inputs for uh, I don't necessarily want to use the term fertilizers because that's not mm -hmm. uh, organic, but uh, some kinds of uh, growth materials that you have, mulch mm -hmm. and uh, seeds and those types of things. Well, we practice sustainable agriculture. We're trying to build a local sustainable food system and that means taking care of the land as well as you know, growing vegetables that are good for our bodies and the environment. And so we make our own compost on the farm. We collect food scraps from the neighbors and, um, so you really, you're outreaching into the mm -hmm. community, Pertula, to many more people than actually are in the garden program itself then? Oh yes, yes. People from all over DC find out about us if they Google compost or they Google gardening or farms, urban farms, will come up and they'll call us and say, hey, do you take food scraps? And we say, yes, these are the days you can drop it off. Or even when we close, we make it accessible for people to drop. Um, drop off their food scraps on the farm and we use windrows, a technique um, to, you know, um, make our own fertile soil, which is the compost, which goes back into the farm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what so, you're yeah. doing then, you're really collecting uh, food scraps and, and other organic materials. So you're actually, one is you're getting, taking it out of the waste stream so mm -hmm. it doesn't go to the city dump or, mm -hmm. you know, some kind of uh, long-term uh, trash facility. Uh, but also you're actually accruing more and more organic materials, mm -hmm. so you're really building the soil. Yes, and also it, it, uh, you use fuel to transport a lot of that material to the landfills and it's saving on um, fossil fuels and um, carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. So definitely uh, building the soil and you know, reducing carbon emissions. There's, there's so many environmental benefits to urban agriculture. Well, we have uh, almost no time left. See how fast that goes? Wow. Isn't that amazing? No way. What's the last, <laughs> what was the last sta statement? Maybe 10 seconds that you would like to share with the audience? Sure, I would right 10 now. seconds? Right now. 10 seconds. Oh, get involved. Um, get involved with the farm. Visit our website, commongoodcityfarm.org, and participate. Fantastic. And thank you for being with us, Pertula. And thank you as we create the Emerald Planet. Osama bin Laden calls getting nuclear weapons a religious duty. Today, materials that can be used to make nuclear weapons are stored in more than 40 countries. Sometimes protected by just a chain link fence. Yet not enough is being done to lock down these materials before terrorists steal them. Why did we learn all this? My mother. My son. My sister-in-law. Were all murdered September 11th. Help protect America. Together we can. Please join us. The stem cell issue is being debated throughout the country. Truth is, most everyone has an opinion, even if they don't know the facts. Let's stop arguing and start really understanding the potential of stem cell research. For us and for millions of Americans living with disabilities, get the facts. Call 1-877-842-3442 for free information from the Stem Cell Research Foundation. That's 1-877-842-3442. Following the tragic events of September 11th, there have been hundreds of violent attacks against innocent Americans. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. Remember, please stop the hate. We're stronger when we are united. Remember. Remember what that flag you're waving stands for. One nation under God. Indivisible. With liberty. And justice. For all. In America, there's either room for everyone or it's not America. Don't pick the wrong fight. Let's keep America land of the free. Stop the hate. Planning a home renovation? Put this at the top of your to-do list. Because after 10 years, none of you are protected against tetanus and another potentially fatal disease, diphtheria.
A minor injury, such as a cut or a scrape, can put you at risk for a tetanus infection. And while safety gear offers some protection, an up-to-date vaccination called the TD Booster is the best insurance against tetanus. So get the TD Booster. If it's been 10, do it again. to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. and the United States as we look for the thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. All of us know, or at least it's been reported, that we may have nine billion people on the planet by 2050. One of the concerns besides water and basic infrastructure, of course, is food. How are we going to feed 9 billion people? And there are many people saying, well, we can't do it. Others are saying, yes, we can, that there's literally billions of acres or hectares of land all over the globe, much of it in urban areas now, as 54% of the people do live in urban areas, that actually is fallow, and some of it has not been used in several hundred years. And so we have two people that are actively involved in urban farming, urban gardening, and they are absolutely making a difference. And you're going to see some of the uh, photographs of the work they're doing. We have uh, Josephine Chu that's sitting over on the, the far uh, left of me. She's an aftercare teacher and garden club coordinator at the Washington Yuling Public uh, Charter School. And uh, Yolanda Hawthorne is sitting right beside me. She is a coach of Girls on the Run. We're going to explore that a little bit besides the gardening. She's also at the Yu uh, Ying uh, Public Charter School. And she's also a food education teacher at Savoy Elementary School in Washington, D.C. Uh, within the public school system. So ladies, welcome. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you. Glad to have you here on the Emerald Planet. And uh, since you're sitting closest to me, uh, Yolanda, we're going to start off with what is the uh, Yu Ying uh, uh, Charter School? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the Yu Ying Public um, Charter School started four years ago with um, a vision to teach and nurture kids in Mandarin. Uh, Yu Ying stands for Nurturing Excellence. Uh, my daughter. You want to restate that? Yu Ying stands yes. for Nurturing Excellence. Fantastic. I heard you, but I just want to make sure our audience didn't miss that. That's a beautiful name. Yeah, my daughter has been there since pre-K, and she is now a blossoming um, third grader. And um, she's been about the program from day one, so I can see the change. Um, we, in addition to doing the gardening with Yu Ying, we also do it with other public charter schools around D.C. I think it's absolutely fantastic and I'm a member of the Rotary Club of Washington D.C. and we give dictionaries to every third grader in uh, Washington D.C. I don't know if your school is on uh, our list but uh, if you see me we'll make sure that we get dictionaries over to all your third grade students and all those that have uh, you know Spanish background we can provide uh, Spanish English uh, Josephine, uh, what's an aftercare teacher? Okay, sure. So at Washington New York Public Charter School, we have an aftercare program. It um, runs Monday to Friday. Um, so Monday to Thursday, we have classes for the students. There's a variety of classes. There's a garden club class, um, cooking classes. Chinese Which you're cooking, actually English the coordinator art. for the garden club. Um, yeah, so I help out with the garden club, help um, teach the kids about, um, about the garden, and then also teach an environmental science and scout class. Um, You're a busy lady. I that's a lot of things to be doing in the after school. So you really are focused on the, uh, the after school, some people would call those latchkey uh, children. So you want to keep them very busy, uh, get them involved but also give them good knowledge and skills they can use for a whole lifetime. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so we want to um, give these uh, kids really, uh, just as you said, the skills that they'll be used for a lifetime. So especially now, um, the sustainability skills. Um, so how, for example, some of the topics that we went over in our Science and Scout class, how to make solar cookers. And so we really go over different topics such as solar energy, wind energy, and really incorporating that all in 
to what they're learning already and it, they're nice nature center they have now. That is absolutely fantastic. So what you're doing is you're actually creating uh, some of these alternative uh, energy uh, sources as far as uh, cooking, food preparation mm -hmm. is concerned, and then you're actually teaching the children how to actually create those, correct? Right, exactly. That is absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Yolanda, as far as your relationship to the uh, Common Good City Farm, what is that between uh, your charter school and the Common City uh, Charter Farm? So Josephine and I formed a company called Zenphobites. Our company, we work with um, gardens around D.C. Com Common Good City Farm is really close to our school, so we're able to take our kids over and explore the center. We have a nature center at our school, but of course we don't have half an acre. They have so much to, you know, they have um, so much things to explore, the compost bin, the... Um, and we're seeing this in this photograph. I tell you, this is a great photograph of the children and uh, you have the experience, probably a master gardener there uh, sharing with the children because just like what you were talking about, Josephine, this is the age when they really need to be learning about food, nutrition, uh, alternative energy, but also how to do this themselves. <coughs> Correct. So uh, looking at what you're doing, uh, tell us a little bit about your, like your daughter is in, in this program. What is she learning and how is she progressing as far as uh, about the plants, gardening, composting, all these different issues? Well, Common Good, they have a program for kids where they actually teach them how to um, cook um, items from the garden. And my daughter got involved and we brought over a couple of other neighborhood kids to get involved as well. So they're growing their own food. Um, yeah, in conjunction with Common Good. Yeah. Yeah. I love this. But they actually go in the garden and they pick items <coughs> to cook and they can make anything from gazpacho to a nice salad. Um, and it's quite amazing. Um, and they have, um, they introduced them to a pawpaw fruit mm -hmm. and they didn't know, they had no clue to what it was, a pawpaw fruit. Um, just some wonderful things going on over there. It's really, really exciting. Well, looking at uh, Josephine, what's going on there? Why are the uh, the field trips so important to get out to the farms? I know this is much larger space mm -hmm. than what you have at your charter school, but what are some of the things that they almost intuitively pick up by being in this large expanse of plants and compost and and uh, nature itself? I mean, I think it's definitely a great experience to have the kids to go out to a place like Common Good City Farm. Um, especially because we're just starting out our garden now at Yu Ying to let them see what a farm in DC looks like to give them this um, hands-on experience so they can have a vision of what they can create in Yu Ying and further down in their future. Well, I was going to say, looking at this small space, we have this very large area as far as the, I'm going to go back to uh, that slide. This, uh, Common City uh, Good Farm, and then you come over here, and this is something, uh, it's a small area, and so they really learned uh, scale as far as being able to produce food, regardless of size of area, correct? Right, exactly. So even though um, there's a lot more space at Common Good, we can still apply some of the skills that they learn at the farm to our garden space. Well, looking at this, actually there's some uh, really good uh, ideas and, and skills that come out of this because uh, they learn at the same time, and this may be, uh, Yolanda, what you're learning with your daughter as far as you can take just a window seal or the front porch or the back porch or the patio deck or what have you, and that can actually become a little mini garden, a little mini farm. Exactly. We grow year-round. We grow um, inside on the windowsill and um, of course outside and we're lucky to have a patio and a backyard in DC which is you know pretty impressive um, so the farm just complements it all it's really a wonderful experience oh that's absolutely fantastic uh, looking at uh, these uh, little uh, mini planters that we have here right in front of us uh, what are we looking at uh, Yolanda and, and what are the kids actually planning and what can they hope to harvest out of this well, those are um, herbs um, that the kids planted, rosemary, um, <coughs> lavender, um, basil, mint, mm -hmm, mainly mm -hmm. herbs. It's really, and there's, of course, for um, adornments, there's sunflowers. <laughs> we had big, right. gorgeous sunflowers up there, and it'll just keep changing as the seasons change. Well, looking at this, uh, I don't know if we can get a close-up of this as far as the camera is concerned, but... Uh, we need to uh, look at these as opportunities 
to uh, actually teach the children how to grow and actually they can do it in very small space and I think this is uh, what we're exhibiting here at the side of the school. So uh, in looking at this, uh, how would the children respond to their plants? I know that uh, the interaction with animals and children is always a very positive thing. What about plants? It's amazing, especially if you're taking it from seed. Um, just, you know, in a couple of weeks and they see the germination, the whole process, they're so excited. Um, the most beautiful part, of course, is the harvest. Wonderful, beautiful, gorgeous bell peppers and kids are just biting into it. We love this age group, it's elementary, so they're pretty much open to whatever we give them, they're gonna try it. We've worked with older kids, and not that there's a resistance, but it's more or less like they're more, it's the picky and choosy. At this beautiful ripe age, they're just open to it all. Well, Josephine, I know that, uh, you know, looking at the work that you're doing with, uh, you know, the aftercare and the gardening and all that, those are really important because these are formative years for these children. And in some ways, you're having as uh, large or maybe even a larger impact, you know, than their math and science and English classes that they're having. Well, hopefully, we're really what we're trying to do is complement what they're learning in the math, science, and English classes. And what we're trying to do next is with the at the care program, as we were trying to make sure we push in during the day with environmental and sustainability education and integrate it into the curriculum so that they don't just get it after school but during the, um, the day as well, especially which is really important for the students that don't come to the aftercare program. Well, looking at uh, this, Yolanda, this is really uh, cultural arts tied into uh, gardening, the practical arts, I guess we would say, as well as the academics. What are you seeing as far as the, uh, the, the gain scores the children are making or just their general attitude uh, by having this type of uh, uh, multidisciplinary approach to education? Well, I see us. Um, Zen, of course, as you know, means to enlighten. Um, and that's what we're doing um, on, on, on a level um, that's so basic and raw. We're enlightening the youth at a very young age. For instance, I'll give you an example. Um, that's Savoy Elementary School, the slide that we're looking at now. And the kids had to take a survey and they had to write down what do they like about the aftercare program. And it was all the food education cooking um, classes. And that was like big kudos to us. We were so excited. You know, this is in, in conjunction with basketball and um, other sports. And they, they chose the, uh, the food education classes. So we're really excited about that. Well, this is what I was uh, saying with Josephine. In many ways, they're going to be as they are more excited and get as much out of this as the academics. And that doesn't to put down the academics. Actually, what you're doing, Josephine, is you're weaving all this together. We only have about uh, 20 seconds left. So, uh, Josephine. Josephine, let's close out with you. What do you think is uh, the impact that you're having on the community and the environment? Okay, sure. I feel like the greatest impact we're having right now is we're providing a spark for our children to learn more about the environment that they're in and providing them skills to be truly sustainable leaders of the future. Well, I tell you, I think this is a uh, beautiful message that you have. You in uh, public charter school and girls on the run. And thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. Saving for retirement might be easy for some folks, but for others, it might take a little more work. And for those who haven't started, there are still things you can do to catch up. Oh, that is good news. Like getting out from underneath past debt. And don't get wrapped up with high interest credit cards. Let's get you some eyes. Be diversified with your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Your financial goals are not out of reach. The choice is clear. For a happy ending, choose to save. Everyone with alcohol and drug addiction is in the same boat. With treatment, you can find solid ground. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Dude, are you sure you want this tattoo? Because, just do it! Some mistakes in life are permanent like hearing loss.
To learn how to protect your hearing, visit ASHA.org. You've probably heard about heart disease, but did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, or strokes combined. But there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. as we look around the globe in 143 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. And we're looking at the topic of food. How are we gonna feed some nine billion people? That's actually two billion more on the planet than what we have right now. And so there needs to be a concerted effort to uh, use all of the resources that we have. And as we move forward is to actually produce not just to sustain society, but actually to create an abundance. And so we have two people that are actually working on that and moving forward in order to uh, make sure that we create an abundance within the urban areas. As many people know, 54% of the global population now are in urban areas, and by 2050, over 70% will be in urban areas. So I have uh, Benjamin uh, Brantley, who is the Mobile Market Director. I love what you're doing, uh, Benjamin, we're gonna see what that's all about in a, a minute or two. That's the Arcadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture. And Anita Adilja, who is the urban food grower of the Common Good City Farm. And welcome to both of you. Benjamin, I'm going to go over and talk about your bus sure. that you have. Tell us about uh, the bus. We have taken an old school bus and essentially retrofitted it to be a farmer's market on wheels. Arcadia has its own farm out in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, but we use the bus to go into communities that don't have access to healthy, affordable food. Well, looking at this now, uh, many people, actually most people will not be familiar with uh, Alexandria, Virginia, uh, but that's a small city uh, and uh, it has a small footprint as far as the area for the city itself, but even the home. So, but you have your farm in Alexandria, Virginia. Tell us about getting uh, that type of farm going in a, a, such a high density urban area. It, it was difficult. Um, <clears throat> Alexandria has definitely developed. Um, Northern Virginia used to have a lot of great agricultural land, but um, as time progresses, people want to be closer to the city centers. So we're the only registered farm in Alexandria County. But as a nonprofit, we've partnered with another nonprofit, um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And they actually manage a historic site in this county um, and have allowed us to lease some of the land, um, returning it to agricultural use, which was which was what it was originally. That is absolutely fantastic. And Anita, I know that uh, it's, you're called an urban food grower. Now that's a, a long title. You used to, I guess they used to call them farmers, but right. uh, actually uh, now there's a different title. So tell us about the title itself. So I think urban grower reflects more closely to what I actually do. So as an urban farmer, you're not just a farm manager managing this space that you're working on, growing food. You're actually engaging the community on a daily basis, and that's so essential to the work we're doing. So I think Urban Grower reflects that. I tell you, it's really a great title that you have, Anita, and it really does reflect, uh, you know, as we move through the 21st century, because you think of the, the farmers that are out in the country, they're isolated, they're doing their own thing. They may share a few ideas amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you know you're in an urban area where people drive by. You may have thousands mm -hmm. of people going by your site yeah. every day, and they're looking out saying, "What's going on over there?" That's so true. how do you reach out into the community so people really know who you are and mm -hmm. what you're doing? So one of the big we do a very large job of outreach in the community, in our surrounding community, just across the street, and in the different housing um, facilities in the area. But then we also 
just go beyond that by doing a lot of conferences and going to a lot of events just to get the word out. And our biggest thing is that we have, we're open actually to the public six days a week. So we're really taking control of that, engaging our community in that way. So anytime during those six days that I'm on the farm, people come in and they volunteer if they want to. We can distribute food at that time um, and really get people working in the soil. I just think it's fantastic. Now, when you say farm, how much uh, land space, I'm going to use that, not acreage, land space do you actually have for your so farm? So we have a half acre, which is actually quite large for an urban area. And if you think of a football field, as being an acre without the end zones. We're about half a football field. And we have fruit trees. You have Actually, in D.C., we have a um, very old set of fruit trees that are really productive. So a lot of folks come out to check those out, too. Oh, so, and really what you're doing is you're creating a special green space, almost like a green lung or a mm -hmm. carbon sump, as they call it. And so there's many uh, positive things yeah. going on with what you're doing. Benjamin, talking about the bus, this uh, farm to bus to customer, what's that transition? How do you select? How do you get, you know, what it is that you're actually taking out into the community to uh, provide the, the consumers there? How does that transaction happen? It's, um, it's a lot of work, <laughs> but um, you know, agriculture is a lot of work to begin with. Um, as a producer, we grow a lot of the vegetables on site. Um, and you know, simply, foot, simply put, I have the bus at the farm, we load up the crates, I put them in the refrigerators on the bus, and I go to um, designated spots that I go to every week, just like a farmer's market, um, and set up shop. And some of the photos you might have seen, um, a lot of the market actually just extends outside the bus. So in that way, it's, it reflects an open air market. Um, folks can peruse as they like, um, but similar to what Anita was saying, it does also entail a lot of outreach. Uh, we built markets from scratch, so that entails a lot of work with community partners, where I park the bus, um, one of my stops being Common Good City Farm. So you always have to be strategic on where you bring the bus to make sure that you're meeting the need of the communities. Um, our mission is to serve low income, low food access, food deserts, um, but also then make sure that people know that you're there. So that's flyering, that's going to the local churches, that's making sure that people know that you're there and that you're having healthy, affordable food and that they can use their food assistance benefits at those markets. I know working in the inner city in a number of uh, cities where we're actually building uh, very specialized, highly energy efficient homes, we used to do the same thing. We used to go door to door, mm -hmm. take little cookbooks, you know, anything that just to get people to know us. And, you know, be some sites where they are constantly vandalized and all that. Uh, over about a 10 year period, we never lost anything. And people would come out when we were there and they just stand around and just make sure things were going well. If we needed an extra pair of hands, they would provide it. Uh, and Benjamin, and what you're doing, are you finding that same kind of uh, gung ho and support in the community because they know who you are and what, what it is that you're trying to do uh, through the bus? I, I would say that we have a, a good deal of community buy in. Um, it does take going to um, your market stops on a regular basis a while before you can build that trust, but um, we had great success. We, we needed to grow a lot at our own farm, but um, you know, we're a proud partner at Common Good City Farm because we also source from other sustainable producers to meet a, a need that is truly there. Um, there's this misconception that food deserts exist because folks living there don't know how to prepare the foods or don't um, want to spend their, their money on these products. But the fact is, is we were frequently selling out of food at, um, at my market stops and had to um, find more producers to help meet that, meet that growing need. But the community is definitely invested um, and really appreciative of the service. I think it's fantastic. And Nita, I know uh, looking at these photographs, it looks mm -hmm. like you had people from the community coming in and yeah. uh, planning and uh, weeding and uh, really uh, becoming involved also in the harvest. So how do you go out in the community and, and have people come in? Uh, do you have employees? Are you doing all this with volunteers? Just what is the organizational structure mm -hmm. that you have for the farm? So we actually have a very small staff and we rely a lot on volunteers, but our biggest, our flagship program is called Green Tomorrows and that's how we really got, get out in the community. Um, if you live in DC and you make less than a DC living wage, if you come on our farm for two hours a week to vol volunteer, lend a hand and actually learn farming, we distribute up to 10 pounds of produce per visit per week. 
Oh, that, that is absolutely incredible. Yeah. yeah. So that's where we 10 get Ten pounds of food. That's a lot of food. It's a lot of food. Yeah. yeah. So you can feed actually uh, multiple members yeah. of, of extended families then. Right. Our hope is to feed a family of four for a week um, on what we give. And we give a lot more than that mm. during peak season. That's absolutely yeah. incredible. I didn't realize that you were doing that. So uh, looking at the, the bus and the uh, Common Good uh, City Farm, Benjamin, uh, how has that uh, relationship evolved over time and how do you see that uh, growing and expanding itself in the future? Well, this was our um, pilot season with the bus. I know Common Good has had um, a number of years under its belt. Um, but, you know, in the nonprofit agricultural world, um, a lot of these organizations are closely linked and um, partnerships are key because it's um, a very steep learning curve and if you're going to be doing it sustainably, um, you know, you want to be troubleshooting with your, um, with your peers on how to do so. But um, yeah, it's been a great relationship. I loved bringing the bus there this um, past year and hope to do so again um, in 2013. Nita, looking at uh, what happens as far as the, uh, the volunteers and the people within the communities, how do you feel like that you're changing attitudes as far as fresh fruit, vegetables, mm -hmm. herbs, and incorporating that into the cooking that goes on within each individual family, and maybe even encouraging people to go back and actually start cooking again instead of just using prepared foods. Yeah, <clears throat> so what we do in addition to distributing food is we really teach, we really teach people how to prepare the food that they're growing. So we supply recipes with them and we also have an outdoor kitchen space. So we do a lot of food prep with both adults and youth on the farm. So we actually teach them how the food they're getting, what it is, where it comes from, and hopefully they've actually helped in growing that food. And then in turn they learn how to cook it as well. We've actually just next door subsidized housing and we built six raised beds this season there, so they can actually practice the growing that they've learned at Common Good, right next door in their own homes. Now looking at the, what they call CSAs, mm -hmm. these uh, uh, commercial service uh, agreements, how do you use that and are you actually using CSAs with the, what, the work that you're doing? Right. Yeah, we actually did have a small CSA this season, just 10 members, and it was income qualifying again. So if people didn't have time to come and volunteer on the farm, they could just pay $10 a week and pick up a share of vegetables that way. And again, we provided some education along with that. So that was our way of reaching folks who might be too busy to volunteer on the farm. Uh, Benjamin, looking at the bus, we're about running out of time, so uh, I want to split it between the two of you. Uh, what do you see for the future of the bus itself and how are you addressing this issue of the food deserts? Well, um, we're a mobile market, so ideally in the longer term, I'm going to work myself out of a job and showing that there's a demand in these communities and eventually passing on that demand to a corner store or something more sustainable so we can bring the bus elsewhere. But for 2013, I just hope to bring the bus to many of the same stops as well as expand to a few more communities of need. So you're reaching out uh, more and more. Anita, looking at uh, what you're doing as far as working with the uh, common uh, Good City Farm and then through your Arcadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture, what do you see for the future? I hope to see a lot more of what we have partnerships opening up in all urban areas because there's definitely a very high need for it. Well, it's fantastic. I just love what you're doing. Benjamin, I had a chance to see your bus some months ago, and I just love the idea of the concept. And Anita, it's uh, great that you're doing this urban farming, and uh, I, I just love your title as, uh, as far as what you're doing. And thank you for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet. She's had more than a dozen fractures. And in the next few years, she faces two major surgeries to strengthen her fragile bones. She's only 10 years old. Most people don't worry about fragile bones until late in life. For those with osteogenesis imperfecta, brittle bones are a concern throughout their lifetime. Find out how you can strengthen this child's future. Diabetes is a killer. After I was diagnosed, I didn't feel sick, so I didn't listen to my doctor. Then it struck. I had a heart attack, then a stroke, and I was only 49. Most people with diabetes also have high blood pressure and cholesterol, which can cause severe heart damage. In fact, two out of three people with diabetes die from heart disease or stroke. Don't let diabetes destroy your life. Call for your free diabetes survival guide. Choose to live.
we're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome back to the Emerald Planet. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet TV and Emerald Planet. And we're looking around the globe in 143 different nations looking for the best practices, the service, the technologies, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. As many of you know, we're going to be adding almost 2 billion people to the planet by 2050. And so what is going to be done to provide the basic infrastructure, but more importantly than that is the water and the food production for all these new mouths to feed. We have two people with us that are actually on the consumer, but also the volunteer side of uh, producing food in urban areas, which now takes up about 54% uh, percent of the population on the planet. And I'm going to introduce the two of them. And I have uh, one of my main men right here sitting beside me. This is uh, Christopher Hinton. Uh, he's in the after school program, Learning for Environment, Agriculture, and Food, called LEAF. I like the name of that. That's a really great name. Uh, he's a third grader at Garrison uh, Elementary School in Washington, D.C. And we have Lakisha Mosley, who is his mom. Yes. And she's uh, in the what's called Green Tomorrow's Program. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, both of these are great names. Yes. I tell you, it's good to have you here, Christopher. You're a very sharp young man. Yes. And you're going to do well in life. Tell us, tell us about LEAF. Well, it's a good job. Like when you cook the food, it tastes good. And when you pick the stuff, it really helps because it helps the uh, uh, plants. Well, it's good for the plants, it's good for the soil, but it's good for us as human beings, right? Yes. So uh, having fresh vegetables, I bet your mom's a good cook, isn't she? Yes. No, you just, just say yes, all right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lakeisha, looking at uh, what you're doing, how do you feel about the, the LEAF project, but also the Green Tomorrow's program that's going on uh, through the, uh, the uh, Common Good uh, City Farm here? Actually, I think it's a great idea. It's a good program to have in the community for our residents. They utilize the program as well. They go over there, they get the fruit, it's fresh, it's clean, the environment is clean, the atmosphere is nice, so it's a very good program. Um, it instills in the young youth to how to use fresh greens and fruit in our community. I think that's really important, and this is something, Christopher, that I don't know if you've seen a difference yet in uh, your attitude and what you're doing as far as school is concerned. Do you see any difference between the, some of your friends who are not involved in LEAF and are not going over to actually to the farm to uh, volunteer and, uh, and what you're getting out of the LEAF program? Sometimes when I go over there and ask, they be like, no, and sometimes and it, it just like be me and some of my other friends. So really, there's, uh, your finding is that what you have to do is you've got to go out now and promote and, and to get your friends to become involved. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Oh, I think that's fantastic. LaQuisha, looking at as a mom, what do you see that Christopher's learning that he's bringing home day to day or week to week as far as nutrition, obesity, and uh, just good food in general? Christopher is very, very excited about the uh, Commonwealth program over there. And he goes over there, actually, he's been very involved in it. Christopher is utilizing it with his weight. He used it to say he losing weight. He brings vegetables from the farm to the house. He wants me to cook it. He grows, he grows it in the grass in the front of our house. He grows greens, he grows broccoli, he grows string beans. My so he goodness, loves, he's becoming a real farmer. Yeah, he, he loves, he's excited. He comes home with packets of carrots and watermelon, cucumbers. So he's, he's been growing it outside of our yard. So I really, really think that that's really good with Christopher. That's absolutely fantastic. And also he's taking care of, uh, a as uh, in the Buddhist uh, tradition, we call a living being because they look at plants mm -hmm. as well as humans and animals as all part of the totality of Earth. So it's really important that we take care of the plants as well as uh, the animals that we have and, and our neighbors. So looking at uh, Christopher, and is there any other people in your community like yourself, Laquisha, that's becoming a part of the program, excited about it, and also getting their children involved? We have several residents that utilize it, and they go over there, they have plots, they have lots over there where they go. 
they they uh, treat it over the weekend. They go every day. They hose it down. They eat actually out of it. So they so they are really utilizing it. And I think it's a good thing that it's over there for the community to see. Now, we're well, looking at it, Christopher. What what do you see as far as yourself and uh, your feeling about the environment? You know, what's outside your own uh, home on your way to school on the the garden itself, how do you feel like that's changed your attitude or your thinking about the environment itself? It changed really better. Like, it's good when I ask my mom, can I go? So, like, if they're not there, I just go on the playground, something like that. So you're able to go outside and, and uh, becoming maybe a little more independent yes. in what you're doing? That is absolutely it's incredible. Right his home. It's right outside our house, actually. Oh, is that when right? When we walk out our door, it's right to the right. It's directly across the street. So I don't feel, you know, I let him go over there because it's safe over there. Mm -hmm. The people over there are generous. They are nice. So I don't have to go behind and check on him. We communicate all the time once a week, me and Anita. And, the people over there she worked with the staff, we communicate. So Christopher's over there every day. Well, I think that's uh, really important that you have a, an environment where you feel safe and uh, wanted and you can actually uh, contribute. What uh, changes do you see, Laquisha, as far as the adults in your community? They see the garden, they see people there bringing the fresh produce. Are you seeing more and more people wanting to get involved? Yeah, actually they want to get involved. They're actually bum rushing over each other trying to get lots over there. Wish they have to take turns. And the, and the smaller beds that we have in the community. So once they finish growing over there, the other, other residents can be involved and use it. They're, they're very excited because they are excited. They don't have to go. It's no store, a grocery store in our community. So they utilize the farms to go over there and get fresh food and vegetables, take them home, cook them, and they see the difference in, you know, going somewhere where the things are fresh. It's not, it's not bitten, it's not bug bite, it's not anything over there. The stuff is actually fresh. You can go over there, rinse it off, and just eat it. Oh, that is absolutely incredible. And I know you live in the LaDroit uh, Park uh, area of Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. What changes are you seeing, Christopher, as far as having this uh, large half-acre farm literally right in the middle of the community? What, what positive things are you seeing coming out of that garden besides well, just the fruit and vegetables themselves? Like, it's new people coming. Like, when I first went there, it was fun because you get to pick weeds, you get to do everything, and you just cook. Well, I tell you, you're one of the first young men I've ever seen that liked to pull weeds. Because when I was a, a young uh, guy, we had a huge garden. We had almost an acre garden ourselves. And uh, the job of myself and my two brothers, we had to go out and pull weeds. And it was like every day we had to go pull weeds and, and uh, keep the weeds down. That's a lot of work. Yeah, I was excited he was able to go out there and do that because he was never introduced to it. I didn't introduce him to it. When we, seen the, when we moved to the community in December, we seen a farm there. He, he shot straight over there. He's been faithful. <laughs> I can say he's like one of the staff there. Oh, that is absolutely <laughs> incredible. Now tell us about uh, LaDroit uh, Park and how you think uh, having the farm there, Lakeisha, is actually changing the community. And I don't mean just superficially, but in a very fundamental way. Way. What do I you think see? it's really changed our community as far as people, people within itself, because they're learning how to interact with each other as residents, they're learning how to share, they're learning how to come together as one body, work together, and being able to see the actual work that come out of what they're doing. So they're, they're really excited. Well, this is really an immediate response, immediate gratification that you go out and uh, even though you're putting in maybe coming from seeds or from seedlings, mm -hmm. uh, but actually uh, to see the plants uh, growing. Looking at these raised beds, and I'd like to bring that up as a uh, full screen if we could on the slide. Uh, tell us about these raised beds. What is this all about, Christopher? What do you see when you look at these raised beds and, and people uh, working around the raised bed? I see everything. I see curds. I see flowers. I see cucumbers. I see watermelons. I see everything. So this is really uh, each one of these raised beds. This is almost like a little mini farm in itself then. Yes. And uh, do you have one assigned to you? Do you have one of these or are you helping with the entire half acre area? Yeah, I, I have one. I have curds, watermelons, and I have 
uh, cucumbers, and I have I have radish, and I have spinach. Well, I tell you, that's a that's a good combination, and those are really all good uh, vegetables uh, to have in your diet because uh, many of those are what they call miracle. Uh, vegetables like a radish is really uh, very, very good for you. And I found out something, watermelon is fantastically good for human beings. And all of a sudden I've become a fan of uh, watermelon, uh, oh, Lucretia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Looking at the, uh, the raised bed, I'm leaving this here purposely. Uh, how do you see the community getting involved with these raised beds and, uh, and feeling like they can actually go out and do something that's positive and, and then translate that back into their home area? Um, actually, they're, they're comfortable. They're comfortable. They know that the raised beds are there. They know that the upkeep is, is nice over there. They go over there to the raised beds. They, uh, like I said, they water them. They, they actually grow on their own things. So it's like a project. They take, they take the seeds, they go over there, they grow them themselves. They don't have uh, Mr. Need and them sit down with them and show them how they do it. They go to the farm over there periodically. They go back to their raised beds. They ain't being able to grow what they see. So they, they go back to it. So they're very excited. They get up early in the morning and they leave out to go water it every day. That is absolutely incredible. Uh, looking at what you're learning over there, Christopher, as far as the, uh, the Common Good Farm, what do you uh, see that, uh, how this is going to help you in the future? It helps you a lot. Like, I love the farm. It's big, it's huge, you can grow anything in there. And I love the people that help out. They're not bad or nothing. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, Lakeisha, uh, in the uh, last part, let's leave with this slide, and we only have about uh, 13 seconds. Okay. What would you like to share with our viewers, both here and abroad? Actually, I would like to share for them to come out. I would like for them to come out and being able to see what's going on in the farm and being able to actually eat and take back home. That's absolutely eat. fantastic. What we're going to do is we're going to let these uh, credits uh, roll here.